So, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, I'm now introducing David Schmidt, who will tell us something about testing Puppet modules. Enjoy. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk about uh, the various ways of testing Puppet modules. Um, I've been um, I've been working now for Puppet Labs for a year, but I've been uh, freelancing on Puppet and Linux uh, for quite some time before that. Uh, now I'm re one of the people working on the Puppet, the supported Puppet modules, and during the last year I've learned much about how people uh, do test and should test modules, and since there's a certain gap, um, I will try to give you today an overview of what tools are available to test your modules, and what are the, the smallest and easiest tests that you can run, even if it's just on your local machine or your local workstation, um, to gain confidence in your modules. Um, one thing I, I learned will, while talking to people around here yesterday is that there is a wide range of um, organizations at, at very different development levels. Um, like some people are just um, committing to their Git repository, their changes, and then do no upruns to see if it works or not, while other people um, are already have invested much more in their development and they have code review and uh, automated testing pipelines um, that give you feedback before anything touches production. But I think um, the realization for me is that everybody is testing their Puppet modules. Uh, some of you are still doing it on, on the production systems and I hope I can, I can today provide you with the tools uh, so that you can do that on your local machine, on a CI pipeline, in a way that gives you the feedback uh, so that you can be confident that your changes will do what you expect them to do. Um, for today, I will go over the basic specifications. Uh, that's more a software engineering topic on uh, how those tests are written, what to think about when writing those tests so that you have a toolbox um, and you can start reading the existing tests and example modules. There are quite a few out there that already have uh, a big test suites um, that will give you um, tools to think about how to test modules and so that you can for yourself see which are the interesting tests, which are uh, the tests that maybe uh, could be improved. Um, afterwards, I will go on to testing catalogs, which is a very quick way to get feedback on your change. And the last part then will be uh, thorough system testing, where there are actually tools that will um, spin up complete VMs where your module runs and where you can have uh, high quality feedback from an actual configuration uh, of your module. Um, whether that um, created the configuration you were uh, intending or whether something unexpected happened. First, um, let me talk about the basic specifications. Um, and as I said in the beginning, that's more of a soft engineering topic. And since um, infrastructure as code is a kind of soft engineering, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on talking about how we can formulate the expectations we have on, on the software we are writing, on the infrastructure that we are coding up here. In the, in the, very, basic, um, in the very basic form, we have specifications like a bicycle on a flat surface, when releasing it, will topple over. It's, it's really uh, very simple. It, has um, the object here that we are uh, talking about. It has some conditions in, in which context are we talking about this object. And it has at the end an expectation. Um, what are we expecting with this system to happen in, in these uh, 
in this context. Uh, a different example over here on the right is a bicycle on a flex surface. When I push it, it will roll on for a while. Of course, it's a very trivial example, but I think it already shows much of the structure that is happening here. We have the same object, we have uh, the same precondition here on a flat surface, um, because bicycles on stairs, for example, do not work as well. Um, but then we have um, additional, uh, additional context that is different, and that represents the different use cases in, uh, in which this bicycle can be used. Of course, the more interesting tests then have humans or children on those bicycles. Um, but for today, since we only have an hour, uh, I will uh, skip the more painful parts. In RSpec, RSpec is a Ruby DSL that encodes those expectations that we have on our systems. In a DSL, you can read it here and there are very uh, familiar elements already here. We have the bicycle, we have the context of being on a flat surface, we have the context of uh, when are we, what are we doing with this cycle, uh, we are releasing it or we are pushing it, and in, in the center here we have the expectations that it either just uh, falls on the ground or it rolls on a bit. Um, what is important here, this is already executable code. You can run this as is and it will give you um, the feedback on your expectations. Uh, in, in this case here, it's just uh, run the RSpec command with a few parameters so that it is um, nice and readable uh, and it will give you this documentation output here. And in in this frame of thinking about what are we expecting from our modules, from our system, um, I think this is uh, one of the primary outputs of those tests. Um, this is a list of what are we thinking about when, we're, when we wrote that module. Um, talking about or, or developing modules is already uh, creating executable documentation. And here it goes a step further. Here we are enumerating the use cases of how this code is expected to be used. And it gives a list of, um, in, in that case it's not yet implemented, but it will give a list of expectations that those implementations are, have to fulfill. And uh, this is something that even later we see when we run that after development, this is something that you can integrate in your local workflow and that can give you very quick feedback, is my syntax correct, and so on. Um, of course, um, as I showed before, the expectations do not have yet any code attached, so uh, Ruby can't uh, actually do anything with it. Um, and. Uh, in, in the case of the example of the bicycle, it doesn't know what a bicycle is, so um, the first thing uh, that RSpec provides are methods to add data to those examples. Um, in the simplest case, it's let and a name, and it has back here some Ruby code that creates data for the examples we are running. Um, this data is then held for you uh, during the runtime of an example, and it's, uh, there are rules on when this is refreshed. Um, so you get uh, fresh uh, instances of your code for uh, the next example. Um, and there's a specific uh, thing, the so-called subject, that is the thing, the, the actual code thing, that is being tested in the current context of a bicycle. Um, and in this case, it's just a new class, a new instance of the bicycle with the given owner. And uh, RSpec will take care in the background that for every example, we get a fresh uh, instance here that can be tested according to our expectations. This is important to get fresh examples because if the, if the tests are modifying the data, uh, other tests would uh, maybe fail or have expectations or um, assumptions in there that are not uncovered. Um, the other thing, of course, that we have to add is behavior. Um, RSpec provides hooks in each context. Um, 
that provide you with a possibility of running Ruby code before or after um, each example. Um, in this case, if I want to say, what actually does it mean when I push a bicycle? Um, in, in this fictitious example implementation, it means I need to call two, um, two functions on that object and it will uh, change the internal state of the object. Um, and in this case here, uh, this is run before each example, so uh, every time an example is evaluated, it will also apply these actions um, to define what it means uh, when pushing this bicycle. Um, another feature is uh, sometimes uh, expensive uh, calculations need to be done, like creating a puppet catalog. Um, that need to be shared across examples, and the hook to do so is the all hook, which is run once for the context, um, and the, the data is shared here uh, using uh, instance variables. Of course, the danger here is um, that if this state is modified in one of the examples, other examples, again, may have built-in assumptions in how the data looks like, um, but it is important to keep that to a minimum because during development you want to maybe run only one of the examples because that's what you're currently working on and you don't want to have all the tests running because they take some time. Uh, and so this is something to consider when you're uh, writing this. And finally, uh, you want to add those measures, those expectations, um, how the state after you, after you have uh, defined the object and you have um, defined the behavior uh, that you're looking at, um, the final piece is what is actually expected of that. What does it mean that it should fall over? Um, what does it mean to be rolling? In this case, um, a very again, a very simple implementation. I just have defined two uh, accessors in, in this Ruby class uh, that the is the bicycle rolling and what is its current speed? And the simplest uh, examples here are it is expected to be rolling or it is expected to have certain attributes with a value that is greater than zero or it is uh, alternative syntax. I just put this here for reference so if you look at the slides afterwards you uh, can see what those terms are meaning. Um, there is some Ruby magic going on that this is translated to a call on the subject, which is referenced here by the default it is expected. Um, but again, I think um, the goal here is for you to understand how those pieces are being put together on a very high level, so that if you uh, meet this then in, in example code or in further documentation, you can already have an understanding of what's going on here, how are these pieces fitting together, and um, for the second half, where do I want to go with that? Um, running one of those examples, now that we have uh, integrated all this information and code, um, and I think this is one of, uh, is, is another one of those things where this um, expectation-based approach is very uh, helpful. Um, with all this information, RSpec, when one of these expectations fails, can now give me very detailed and specific information about what is going wrong here. Um, in this case, we again have this example, a bicycle on a flat surface, when pushing it, should have the attribute speed has a value greater than zero. And um, to make this interesting, um, the, the thing I ran here I had a negative speed, which is uh, weird, and that's why um, RSpec is complaining about here, and it can provide us with the source code, uh, the line of the source that is uh, the expectation. So when you have this running in your CI, you already have the context of where this is happening and what was the expectation there. Um, so again, it's uh, not only a test tool, but it's also a communication tool in where you can encode what your intent there was, which is important when you come back like a month later or two months later, or if it's just code from uh, your colleague across the hallway. Uh, 
and they are on, on holidays or just in a different project now and you need to figure out what actually was the expectation there. And uh, being a, a tool with a Ruby development background, it will also provide here the um, actual Ruby class that was in the background with all its attributes um, and with the diff of what went wrong and what was expected. And this again, if it's running in CI, it tries to encode all the information to reproduce that issue um, so that you can uh, go straight to the error and don't have to uh, figure out for a long time what actually was going on there. Um, the, the final thing I want to show you is, in some cases, expectations are not just a single value to be um, tested, but uh, more complex ones. And in this case, you can do it like this. Um, write again a little description up here and add more code in here that does maybe another um, uh, computation or executes a command. Um, and then you can... Uh, it, add an expectation on, on this value that will again lead to a error message if it's not matching like the before one. I know I'm going very quickly those, through those things. Um, uh, oh, uh, sorry. And uh, final thing here. If those expectations become uh, bigger and more unwieldy or um, if you have several use cases that share some of their properties, it is also possible to create um, shared examples like here. Um, I say a rolling bicycle needs to be rolling and again have a speed greater than zero. And at any, any point in my, in my test suite where I have a rolling bike, um, I, can, I can use just it behaves like a rolling bicycle and it will use uh, the local subject where that is um, defined and bring with it all those expectations. Um, this is like when I have a module with a class, um, I, uh, as I reuse that class to provide a specific um, baseline for where I use it, um, this in the tests also provides a certain baseline of functionality, how um, the, the test subject here is expected to work. Um, and for example, this is also useful if I then want to add an example like um, that it's not only rolling, but it's also not yet fallen to the floor. I can add this expectation here to the shared examples. And when the test suite runs, it will be um, evaluated in every place where I expect a rolling bicycle. And uh, again, might uncover uh, unknown assumptions or uh, maybe a place where the bicycle is rolling uh, but it's mounted on on a carrier and it's uh, it has some different use cases where that means something different and uh, exposing those uh, assumptions then is only the first step to actually addressing the problem but you can address it uh, before you push it to production and you can have those conversations uh, over a coffee and not while your manager is standing over your shoulder and crying why production is currently not working. Uh, during development of uh, a module, something that uh, can be very helpful is uh, this tagging here. Uh, in, in the most common form, uh, what you can do is uh, add for a certain context or a single example, just add this tag here, uh, colon focus. And when running the, the R specs, add dash dash tag focus, and it will only run the specific examples that are tagged with that focus. For example, if I'm currently working on the reverse proxy functionality of Apache, and I don't want to run all the examples that are um, deal with uh, virtual hosting of PHP applications, I can just tag for a while my local uh, examples that are uh, relevant to reverse proxying, and I don't need to uh, execute the whole test suite and um, can save some time during development. Uh, uh, 
I know I've been going quite fast through all those examples because I don't think that we today have the time for you to learn all the details or uh, get familiar with how everything is put together. Um, and I only want to give you an overview that you have heard all those parts that may be relevant to your work. And if you're actually working with it, uh, looking at the documentation of RSpec on Radish app is a much better way because there you have a list of all the possible matchers of all um, the uh, special things you can do with shared examples and shared contexts and how the tagging works. You can read up on all of those features. Um, so that you can use the tool to its, uh, uh, for all its worth for, for your work. Um, another site I would like to suggest to you is Better Specs. Um, it's not specific to Puppet modules, um, but more geared toward uh, other software engineering. Um, but it will, if you browse through the examples they give and the recommendations they do, it will give you an, a feeling for how uh, well-written examples look like so that um, later on um, you can uh, benefit from the experience that is encoded there in how to write examples that actually tell you uh, what's going wrong when you hit one of those hidden assumptions. But now let's get to, to the real interesting thing. Um, how do uh, these RSpec tests actually work when we have a Puppet catalog and what are the expectations we have on our Puppet catalogs when you're developing uh, a new piece of functionality for an existing system or if you're uh, programming that from scratch. Um, again, I, can, I, I will only show you the, the very minimal set of tests that everybody should run. Um, and that is the baseline of minimal stuff that will already uh, keep you from uh, going back and forth uh, with your production commits or with your colleagues or your test systems because um, and, and I hope after my explanations from before you will be able to, to follow me here. Um, we can have here a, a specification for a scanner class like a virus scanner or an email scanner or uh, anything like that. Um, and when you put this uh, using uh, the, the relevant uh, boilerplate files that I, again, I will skip here for you because you can just uh, look at the skeletons that are there and use them to configure it. Uh, but if you put that into the correct location and run the acceptance test, um, you can have the class name here and it is expected to compile with all dependencies. And the magic that is happening here is all within this matcher here, and it will uh, create a catalog that has... <laughs> it, it will create a catalog that has the single include class, uh, include the scanner class, um, and it will try to compile uh, a catalog for that node uh, so that this class is evaluated and it would act as if somewhere on a machine the Puppet agent uh, just asked for, for a configuration for a node that is only classified with the scanner node. Um, and once the, the thing is um, compiled, it will uh, check that the catalog does not have any uh, dependency issues, so um, it, it already provides at least the confidence that you didn't have any typos, that all the types you're referencing exist, um, that you're not waiting for a notification of something that's not in your catalog, all the classes you include exist, and so on and so on. Um, of course, uh, that could still mean that the configuration file that the scanner class here is deploying has a syntax error that will cause the, the scanner to fail. But the big advantage of this one here is this runs on, yeah, on, on any of your laptops, you can run this uh, and you will get an answer within one or two seconds. And it will already provide you with much information and confidence that what you've written is not total garbage. Um, I mean, it's, I hope, something we all aim for, but there are distractions and we need to get our work done. And having this check already, um, 
can give you the confidence that, that you haven't missed anything. I mean, I usually uh, can't write code on the first try that passes that. Um, and I, I don't think now I'm, I'm so stupid. Um, so it's, it's not something to be uh, too concerned about, um, but having someone to double check that and give you an answer within a second or two is already um, very helpful to uh, not have to commit it and wait until the CI is running or uh, wait until it's deployed in the Puppet Master and I can have an agent run over there. Uh, but I get the the error message right, right in front of me on my workstation. Of course, the dirty truth is uh, many classes don't work just as include class name and it, and it magically works. Uh, the class wants to know on which operation system is it running, which package should, should it install, it needs uh, keys to work, um, it needs other dependencies, it needs parameters. What RSpec Puppet here provides you with is um, with those let statements as explained in the first part, um, you can add facts to the uh, isolated environment where the catalog is, is being compiled. Uh, you can add params that are passed to the class uh, and you can just add more Puppet code that is included before your class is included. Um, and with with those three things, you can already test, all right, I have uh, rel six boxes over there that need the scanner configured like that, and I have um, rel seven boxes over there that need uh, different params and so on. Uh, and you can encode your different use cases of your class uh, also using different params. Perhaps I have a client here and I have a high security configuration over there. Um, you can encode those different um, use cases in different contexts and again, depending on which feature you're working on, uh, get the required feedback on is it still working or is it not yet broken. <laughs> uh, and the, the other benefit here is um, if, if you're collaborating on your modules, either with yourself over time or with colleagues at the same time, uh, everybody can encode their expectations into those tests. And if you're at one end expecting, like in the high security configuration, you're expecting that there is some other resource present that is uh, relevant to the high security configuration, uh, but you also have a, a workstation configuration that doesn't have those added resources. Um, this can already tell you that while working on the high security configuration, you created something that will not work on the workstations. Uh, and again, you have a error condition that maybe even when committing to production and trying it out on one of the high security hosts, you would not have seen because you did not, uh, while working on the one feature, did not think about the consequences on a different host. Uh, of course, in uh, with more investment in automation, you don't always have to run those on your local system. And again, a trade-off between uh, quick feedback and in-depth uh, checking of your module is um, what I often do is I run the tests I'm working on locally while I'm working on and when they pass, I pass it on to the CI and the CI will tell me if there's anything else I missed because it's easier to let the CI do the work and have a coffee uh, than, than wait on it on your, on your local workstation. Um, uh, the other thing that the RSpec Puppet gem provides is not only expectations on the basic that it compiles and, and has all the dependencies fulfilled, um, of course, what's also important is often to verify that a specific configuration contains um, specific resources, like um, recent example was on the NTP module. The NTP configuration on SUSE 12 has very interesting opinions about how NTP should be configured. Uh, but if you just want to have it configured to talk to your specific NTP servers that interferes, and now there is a test um, that requires that that specific configuration is deleted on SUSE 12. And so there is also um, 
this expectation that on SUSE 12 that file is removed and coded in in the test suite so that if somebody comes along later uh, does not delete it uh, just because but also sees this expectation this assumption here encoded um, to go into the details um, in in my scanner uh, class for example I need to manage this uh, spool directory and I can only manage that after the scanner install class is applied and in the source code of course I want to talk about the top level class because then I'm shielded in the module side from the changes uh, that people do to this install class, maybe the packages change or maybe additional directories needed uh, to be managed there. Um, but in, in the test, what I can then do is I can say uh, the catalog is expected to contain a file with the scanner uh, that notifies the service because that's maybe something else that needs to be done. It needs to have certain uh, parameters and then what I can do is I can be much more specific about my expectations that it requires a specific package and that it requires a specific other package um, to uh, get a little bit more of, of this, this hidden assumptions in the code. Um, not only it needs to require that install class that maybe is in the next version completely empty, but really uh, get into the depth of what the module is trying to do. Um, to, uh, oh, sorry, uh, to, to have uh, the safety and the confidence that as long as this test has been green before uh, rolling that module out to the production, uh, that will work together um, as I was thinking about it during development of, of that feature here. Uh, RSpec Puppet uh, also provides a host of other features. Again, in the short time we have today, I only want to introduce you to them on a very high level so that you know what you're missing out. Um, for defines, if you, if you are not only testing your classes, but also your defines, for example, like Apache vHost, or um, if, you, if you have a database uh, with specific configurations that you're uh, configuring often and where you have a define for that specific kind of database configuration, um, you can add a title uh, to your contacts that uh, is then passed on to the define because you can't pass it through the params, of course. Um, for uh, puppet functions, uh, you have this run matcher where you can say this function is expected to run with the params uh, and return a specific thing. Uh, so this is already very soft engineering programming, of course, um, but sometimes you need to have a specific data transformation or a lookup on an external database. Uh, and this here can, again, help you to check the basic assumptions built into that code um, so that um, you, you have your confidence in, in what's going on over time and with your changes. Um, with types and providers, um, there is, of course, some basic things you can test on a catalog level, uh, but really what you want to do there is test the Ruby code, and that is something that also can be done in this context, but then also requires very specific knowledge about how that Ruby code is running, and um, if you're interested in that, I could probably give another talk about that, but again, out of scope for today, because I, I just want to uh, get, give you the high points here. And finally, something that was added very recently, um, you can say expect exported resources to contain and put any other resource matcher back there uh, so that you can actually also now have access to uh, resources that are not put into the catalog but are exported from a specific configuration or a specific use case of your module um, so that you can um, also add more um, confidence there. Uh, again, a list of resources where you can uh, get further information. Um, Rotrix RSpec Puppet has a very good uh, README uh, that lists all the matchers, all the parameters to those matchers, uh, how it's actually configured in your module so that you can run the tests. Um, 
um, the different kinds of setups you need for functions, for classes, for defines. Um, again, battlespecs.org, I, I really uh, um, recommend that site just as a brief introduction on how well formulated um, expectations look like, because of course you can put everything into one big expectation that expects all your resources in one uh, big chunk of code. Uh, but as you will find out sooner or later is um, that that means that you only see one of the errors in that large block and better specs, that's one of the recommendations from better specs, says every expectation should be its own block and suddenly you get a report of all the expectations um, that were uh, not that were missed by a recent change, and you can get a better idea of what's going wrong. I mean, we all know our code, and having a list of things that that uh, go wrong uh, often already helps to pinpoint what 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 was going on there. Um, just one of the example modules, uh, the NTP modules from Puppet Labs. Um, is I think always a good example for these things because it's um, from, the, from the functionality here very simple, but it has uh, our spec tests at all levels, and you can look at how is it set up there, um, what are the other boilerplate files I need, how is it working there. You can just check that out uh, and go right on running uh, the tests in there using. Uh, using rake or calling rspec directly. Um, so that's always a good thing to, to get started with this, um, just by getting an existing module and, and looking at that code, because that um, some of the setup is still not very um, friendly, but it's already uh, all fixed there, so you can get uh, cracking uh, as soon as you check it out. And uh, finally, if you are having um, uh, many modules where you need to apply that boilerplate, I would point you to uh, the module sync configs. Module sync is a small tool from the uh, Vox Populi, which is a community group of, of Puppet module uh, engineers. Um, they have built this module sync tool that allows you to apply templates for boilerplate stuff across a s bigger set of uh, modules. Uh, and th this repository has our internal um, uh, templates for all the supported modules that we provide. Um, so again, there you can see very, um, very specifically what we are doing to test our modules. The final thing I want to talk about today is um, after making sure that the catalog uh, matches our expectations, as I mentioned earlier, the final problem that has to be addressed is that the configuration file I'm writing out to, for example, again, my NTP daemon or my Apache configuration or uh, the SQL script I'm rolling out to MySQL uh, is being rolled out correctly, but the script in itself or the configuration in itself has a typo and, and an error, or it conflicts with some other configuration in my base image. And the only way to actually find out what's going on there and um, have that running in a local test system is to spin up a complete system and, um, and run those tests against uh, that complete system and see if it actually starts the service and uh, if it actually uh, does what is expected from, from that configuration. Uh, this has several different components that interact here. Um, the first one is speaker. Uh, some of you may already know that name. That's the, uh, it's both the umbrella name for uh, the whole uh, suite of tools that are uh, working here and the core component that is managing the VMs that are created for your tests. Then there is the Beaker DSL. Uh, this allows you to talk to the VMs that are created for you. Um, this has functions to install Puppet on those VMs if you don't have that baked into your base image. Um, this allows you to run Puppet on one of the VMs or on all of the VMs. Uh, 
and the, or it allows you to run shell scripts or anything else you need to verify um, that your code is doing what it's intended to do. And finally, uh, there is the speaker RSpec shim that's just a little library that hooks up all the beaker functionality and the VM management into uh, the framework of the RSpec expectations uh, so that you can use the same uh, shape of tests uh, for your quick catalog tests and for your in-depth uh, beaker tests, um, which I hopefully uh, makes it easier to, to work with, with the whole um, test suite. Uh, VMs is there. Um, Beaker itself supports uh, several different kinds of VMs of hypervisors. Something I use very, uh, very heavily is using Vagrant on my local machine to spin up uh, different base images of the things I'm, I'm currently trying so, to support. Uh, that works very well. Um, other people. Um, for example, in Travis, we use Docker on uh, the GCE VMs that Travis provides to run um, some of our tests in, uh, in Travis against full Docker image systems. Um, internally, there is a backend that talks to vSphere, uh, so you can use uh, VMs from vSphere to run your tests on. Um, and there are other backends for AWS and other cloud providers if, if you have access to those. The first thing when talking about a beaker test is uh, to define which VMs are participating in this test. Sorry. The, uh, the basic execution model is uh, there is the beaker process itself running on the machine that is executing the tests, and it creates the VMs that are participating in this test, and it will then interact with those VMs on behalf of the tests to, as I said before, install Puppet, uh, execute uh, Puppet manifests on those machines, and uh, check the results, if the results are matching our uh, expectations. Um, the first thing to do is then to define uh, the node set um, that is uh, the basis for this test. And in the simplest case, we have a single test host that has the default role that is uh, managed by Vagrant that uses this pre-configured box with uh, no configuration management on it. And also we have to tell Beaker what platform is running in this image so that it can choose the right um, provider to interact with that. Um, and uh, in, in this case, um, the default role is all we need because it's only a single node. Um, and every time we, we interact with a VM, it will interact with this VM. Uh, this, um, this node then needs a little bit of setup so that we can actually uh, execute our tests on it. Um, in, in the spec helper acceptance, which is the main entry point for the whole test suite. Um, uh, you can uh, just say install the Puppet agent on the default node, um, copy the module from where we are currently at using the name scanner uh, to the default node. And for example, if you need any dependencies of those modules installed, uh, run Puppet module install with a, a module name on that test node and it will go out and, and do that for you. Um, there are many more options that you can ha add here. You can use your private forge uh, mirror. You can use um, R10K to install that. You can just check out a Git repository. That again very much depends on your uh, private workflow. Um, and uh, you will, uh, ha most of the of the open source modules that are out there, just install from the forge uh, and, and use those dependencies uh, to fulfill uh, the needs of the, of the module there. And then um, this, again, like before in the catalog testing, the compile, here is the simplest test that can be made using a, 
using a full VM. Uh, and that is, um, again, we described the scanner class here. Uh, we put in a manifest. Maybe if that is more complex, you want to load that from from an external file or something like that. Uh, but you can also just put in the string here with the scanner class and the params you want to do. Uh, you want to apply the manifest on the default host and store the result here in an instance variable. Um, as explained earlier, this is so that uh, the expensive uh, prior manifest run here that actually goes out and uh, compiles the manifest on that agent and does all the configuration stuff that is defined in that class only runs once um, before all examples here. And then the example itself is very easy. It says um, this puppet run should exit with um, the exit code 2, which means there were actual changes to that system, but no errors. And uh, again, like the compiled catalog that doesn't tell us too much of the system yet, but it's again the 70-75% uh, solution because once the catalog applied without errors, it can't be too bad, <laughs> couldn't it? Um, and here, while the former slide showed the simplest test, I think this one here is even more important because this is the second run. Um, that checks that it runs idempotently. It just runs the same apply manifest with the same manifest again on the same node, stores the result locally, this time without an add in front, so it's just a local variable, and the exit code from this puppet run should be zero. So that means there were no errors and there were no changes. And in but what often happens if you have a typo in a service, um, Puppet will start the service and the service will go, oh, okay, I'm started. So now I want to read my configuration file and oh, that configuration file has an error. So, well, then I don't, I, I, no, I don't start it. But Puppet already went on and, and saw the service has started properly. On the second run, Puppet will see, oh, that service did not start. Please let me help you here. I will start the, the service again and then it will have a change and, and an exit code of 2 and not of 0 and you can see, oh, something is wrong there and you need to investigate. Of course, it, it is not very specific yet, but this already will uh, save you from pushing things to production that otherwise will have caused your service to fail or not to restart um, and so on. So again, um, we can exchange uh, discussing a problem, or, uh, we can exchange being yelled at for breaking the production with um, discussing a problem in our code over a coffee um, while everything else works on fine without any problems. Um, beyond the simple has it applied without errors, um, there is a server spec integration again for the details and all the functionality that it provides, I will refer you to the documentation afterwards. Um, but the basic thing here is you can describe a service on the target node. And for more complicated applications, you might have several nodes, like one for the database, one for the web front, and one for the memcache, and apply configurations to all of them. And afterwards, check, is my Apache service running? Um, it should be enabled, it should be running, and uh, you can inspect, use server spec to inspect the current system state. Um, in, in this example also it shows a more intricate uh, method of filtering that is not applied by using a command line variable, um, but by looking at one of the facts of the node that is currently being looked at. And using that you can then have um, more in-depth checks for the services you just configured. But beyond that, of course, here is the big question when doing all those full system tests. And that is something where uh, your skill and your talent that is, I think, more than uh, capable to answer this question, how do you know that your service works? 
you already have that knowledge. You know what you need to look at to know that your service is working. Using all the tools I presented to you here, um, I cannot tell you how your service works. I cannot tell you what is right for your service. But I can give you the tools that you can create your test environment with a few simple few steps on your local machine, on your CI system, in a test environment that nobody else needs to see, uh, where you can actually test your system, your service, your application, and say, yes, if I apply this change to my Puppet modules, afterwards, it's still working. And, and I hope you, you will follow me here to see that uh, that's where you can invest to uh, really get the value out of those automated tests um, to, avoid, uh, to, to avoid having um, those tests on your production systems. Uh, finally here, uh, again, the resource list, and I hope uh, those slides will be made available to you afterwards, so you don't have to write them down now, is um, Beaker RSpec, uh, that schema I talked about, that connects Beaker and uh, the Beaker language and the RSpec language. Um, it has a uh, list of configuration options. For example, one thing you can do while developing is reuse the VM you've been working with. So, um, Provisioning a new VM that takes often a while, even on our great laptops around here. Um, but what you can do is you can tell the test tool to reuse that provisioned VM. And so during development, if you uh, already have that provisioned VM, you can achieve runtimes from um, a single example that compiles and applies a change to, to your VM in, in below 10 seconds. And I say this because Having uh, a 10 second feedback loop on your change on a VM in, in your test environment is, I, uh, for me as a module developer, just liberating because I can, I can do a change, I can test it out, I can do a change, I can test it out. Oh, uh, there is this other expectation I have, I add that expectation to my test suite, I add it to my current focused uh, examples, um, I run those expectations, and I can um, very easily um, encode all of these checks that I would have to have a browser open and I would have to log in and I would have to log in again because restarting the Apache cleared the session cache or whatever. Um, having it in code uh, is, is just so much more convenient during developing the modules. And um, another thing I, I would like to add here is you are not alone when developing that. Um, most of the services that uh, we deploy have some developers that actually have an interest in that it actually works when, after it's deployed. Um, and um, take them into their responsibility of providing you with the help um, and the code and the hooks into the status API and so on where you can actually check at every step of the process uh, that the services you are managing for them actually is working. And if they don't provide that, well, the patch is up, it's fine, isn't it? Um, another resource is the Beaker DSL API info um, that will give you a list, a, a reference and description of all the functions that the Beaker DSL provides to you for um, talking to those VMs. Uh, did I already mention better specs? read it. It's, it's really a very easy list of recommendations on how to um, structure your specs so that they remain readable, that they remain understandable, that they actually provide you that documentation of your intentions, value, that they can provide to you. Um, Modules and Configs, again, also has the boilerplate for these kinds of tests. Um, the NTP module also has this kind of tests. Only a few weeks ago, I changed it so that the uh, default uh, uh, node sets that we roll out with our modules actually work. If you have Vagrant installed, um, it should work without modification as long as you have all the, the Ruby utilities installed. Um, and finally, uh, there is uh, in the Beaker documentation the list of Beaker libraries, uh, a short list of tools that can help you with more intricate uh, setups of your tests if you need to install different versions of Puppet. Um, 
and so on. Uh, have a look, uh, maybe you'll find something that you can use. And with this, uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, uh, I'm around till, till the evening today, um, or uh, on Twitter, or using my Puppet email address. Uh, just give me a shot, and I'm also working on the community contributions for modules, so ping me on GitHub. Um, I always try to be there for people who have questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, David. Any questions so far? We have three minutes for, quest for questions. Yeah. Are there any tools for helping testing migrations? Because every test I see is always starting from scratch. From scratch is easy, <laughs> and production is not in scratch. Um, you can use um, Beaker. Uh, the Beaker DSL to create sequences of of your systems. For example, you can um, in in the setup script you can say, "All right, um, get me my base image, provision it with the old version, get the old version from over there in Git, deploy it to that system, provision it to that state, and and then apply your expectation on top of that layer." Yes. That's nice. Thank you. Um, another thing that I might want to mention is um, those tests, you don't have to only run them for your um, component modules, but something if you want to have a quick, uh, quick payoff is um, add them for your profile classes or for your role classes. It's very easy. It's one line or two lines, a little bit of data, and you already have something in your hand that can tell you, oh, I'm, I'm not completely screwed now. Any other questions? We could handle one more. So you mentioned uh, the possibility to um, run bigger tests on rows. Uh, is there already a way easy to, on a full control repo, have some kind of bigger tests for different rows, something like that? Um, the, the question was whether there is a way to uh, to already have uh, beaker tests on roles defined in your control repo. Was that correct? Yes. So um, the beaker tests are not actually dependent on your repository being a module repository. Um, things like the copy module two uh, function. Of course, they, they, you can pass a path there and deploy some modules like that. Um, might require a little bit more programming, but it's also just a loop over all my modules. You can just copy everything. There is a, a SCP2 method. Um, you can. What we are doing internally for our QA is we actually don't use just a agent, but we install a complete Puppet Enterprise stack and and do master agent testing. Um, so. Uh, depending on your use case, uh, the sky is the limit, and uh, again, uh, maybe a little bit programming to get that setup and provisioning steps uh, done. Uh, maybe reusing existing automation if you already have that for your Puppet Master, uh, and then you have uh, the environment and the use case, the context, to again run through your expectations uh, and, and your use cases. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you all. Okay.